good to be with you tonight, and I'd like to extend the welcome that has already been extended, and it's good to uh, back normal now, I guess, with the lectureship being over. do appreciate all the help and all the, the smoothness with which the lectureship went. A lot of comments on Facebook about it and such, and uh, just a tremendous congregation here to host such a thing, and um, just, just want to extend my thanks to that which has already been given. Uh, today, um, we're going to look at some things concerning the resurrection and the end of time. And uh, what we believe about the resurrection does matter in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. The King James says, study to show yourself approved unto God. The New King James reads, be diligent to present yourselves approved unto God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And many of us have memorized that passage, and, uh, but yet if we continue to read, he says, But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their uh, message will spread like a canker. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, and um, have uh, saying that the resurrection is past already, and they have overthrown the faith of some. Now, we had a whole sermon on that about six months ago, well, between three and six months ago. I forget right away. But the point here is that what we believe about the resurrection matters. I'm not going to preach that same sermon again. Uh, in this case, it says what they believed was error from the truth. They strayed from the truth, and they caused others. They overthrew the faith of others. Also, we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 12, and this whole chapter is about the resurrection. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? And so were those uh, in Corinth who were denying the bodily resurrection. In fact, this whole chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, deals with the bodily resurrection. And so tonight we want to take a look at uh, the AD 70 doctrine. I'm going to go on and explain all that. But really this is more of a study not about that doctrine so much as it is about um, the end of time, about the resurrection, about uh, God's plan for the end of time. Uh, but this doctrine has been floating around at least uh, since the uh, late 50s, late 60s, early 70s around there. And it seems to be creeping back up in some areas. And we'll go on to define this in just a moment even more so. Sometimes this is called realized eschatology. And uh, last night, right before I went to bed, I thought about, you know, it's, I, could make, I could coin that phrase there instead of realized eschatology. Uh, it's more like realized contradictology. There's a word I invented there. But you'll see what I mean by that in just a moment. All right, now just to do an overview of this real quickly, this AD 70 doctrine. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as Kingism or Max Kingism because of who started it. And I actually uh, met somebody um, somewhere about a month or two ago. I'm trying to think where. Maybe it was at a gospel meeting or visiting a congregation somewhere. And he actually knew uh, Brother King, uh, who has passed away now. But he knew him from Ohio. He was from Ohio, and I think maybe he preached in West Virginia also. But he was in Ohio when he came up with this doctrine. And uh, the best way to describe the doctrine is to show you what uh, King affirmed in a debate with Gus Nichols that took place in 1973. And King affirmed, he said, the Holy Scriptures teach that the second coming of Christ, including the establishment of the eternal kingdom, the day of judgment, the end of the world, and the resurrection of the dead occurred with the fall of Judaism in 70 A.D., all right, now, of course, current usage now, they want you to put A.D. before the number. B.C. goes after, A.D. before. But that's a, an English grammar thing. Uh, but notice some of these statements here. Uh, Christ's second coming, including the establishment of the eternal kingdom. And so this doctrine says the kingdom did not fully come until A.D. 70. Uh, also, the day of judgment was A.D. 70. It's not ahead of us, but it already happened. Also, the end of the world already happened in A.D. 70, and uh, the resurrection of the dead also occurred with the fall of Jerusalem. In other words, every verse in your Bible that, that points to a future day of judgment 
they say was fulfilled in uh, AD 70. Every verse in your Bible and your New Testament that points to a future resurrection, they say was fulfilled in AD 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem. And so you might ask, well, what are we here for then? And uh, what do we have to look, live for? And those are very valid questions, but you'll have to ask them that because I don't know the answer how, what they, how they would say on that. All right, but I want to begin with a biblical timeline. A biblical timeline. Uh, we start out with time has a beginning and has an end. Now, the arrows there are eternity. And, of course, we know that before, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, that before the beginning, when God created, there was eternity. In fact, John 1, 1, you know, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we've had a sermon on that before, too. And those words was are imperfect, continuous, past tense. So before there was even a beginning, the Word and God already existed. Uh, but time has a definite starting point, Genesis 1, 1, and it has a definite ending point. And we call that Judgment Day. Now, during when God first created things, we call that the Patriarchal Age. And then uh, God called his people out of Egypt, uh, the sons of 12 sons of Jacob. Uh, actually, uh, you know, you had 11 sons. Levi didn't get an inheritance, but then Joseph, his two sons, got, got two. And that makes up the 12. I think I felt the lectureship mentioned that. But then you had a Mosaic law. Now, in Deuteronomy 5, verses 1 through 4, that law was not given to anybody else except for uh, the descendants of Israel. That is, Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. Moses said he did not, did not make that covenant with uh, our fathers, but with all of us uh, who are alive this day. And so, uh, here we go right here. Uh, that was just for God's Israel, God's people. Uh, the Gentiles were not under that. Uh, they could proselyte to that, but they were not under that. And then came the cross. And the cross uh, brought, an, brought an end to both the Mosaic Age and the Patriarchal Age. And such passages as Ephesians 2, 11 through 22 tell us that. He made of two one man by his death on the cross. And those two are the Mosaic and the Patriarchal so that all could be called Christians. And then uh, Acts chapter 2 uh, the church was established, the kingdom was established, and uh, that is referred to as the Christian age, or the last days, a number of terms could be given there. But when we talk about religious history, there are only three periods of time. Sometimes these are called dispensations, although I like to get away from that word, because a lot of people think, you know, millennialism and all that. But it's a scriptural word, dispensation, ages, the patriarchal age, mosaic age, the Christian age. And you'll notice, um, uh, you know, patriarchy to submit to God. You know, he spoke to the fathers by the prophet. The mosaic age, he sent the prophets to the people. He had the priests and all that. And so different systems, but yet under the Christian age, there's only one system for everybody now. And that is the gospel system, and that was set up in Acts chapter 2. The church was established. And then at the end of the first century, uh, the whole Bible was complete by the end of the first century. Now, the book of Revelation, uh, it may have been written A.D. 70. Some say A.D. 96. Some day say A.D. 70. But at least we know by the end of the first century, written Revelation was complete. Now, it is true that, you know, the uh, Apostle John, who they say was uh, the last to die, and tradition says, uninspired history says, that he was the only apostle to die of, quote, natural causes. Now, he could have laid his hands on somebody at the end of the first century, and that person could have done miraculous gifts and so forth, maybe into the second century. We don't know that. Uh, but for sure, Revelation, the perfect law of liberty, was complete by the end of the first century. Well, A.D. 70, and this, this map uh, obviously is not the scale. You know, we live, we, we live way over here somewhere, and we don't know when the end is going to be, but, you know, I had to make it kind of big like that so you guys could see it, and I guess you can see most of it anyway. Uh, but A.D. 70 is when Jerusalem was destroyed. Now, Judaism ended spiritually right here at the cross, okay? <clears throat> now, you do have 50 days between the cross and Pentecost, Forty of those days, Jesus was upon the earth in the resurrected state. 
<coughs> you know, showing himself by many infallible proofs, Acts 1, verse 3, and uh, speaking things concerning the kingdom, Acts 1, verse 3. Then he ascended to the Father after those 40 days, and then 10 days later, the church was established in Acts chapter 2. Uh, politically, Judaism ended in A.D. 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem, politically. All right, now that is the biblical timeline, the biblical timeline. Well, the uh, A.D. 70 timeline is very similar to you get to A.D. 70. Now, in A.D. 70, they say that that is the end of time that all the prophecies that talk about Jesus coming, judging everybody, everybody going to heaven or hell, etc., that is all happened in A.D. 70. And the rest of time, we don't know anything about. Now, now they, don't, they don't think that, you know, everybody went to heaven, that we're living in heaven right now, but they're saying that all those passages, every single passage in your New Testament that talks about the resurrection uh, was either figurative or it was literal only, as it, re as it related to the destruction of Jerusalem. And every passage in your New Testament that talks about a coming day of judgment, a coming day of reckoning, already happened with the destruction of Jerusalem. And, uh, and so they have, another thing they have here, they have the law of Moses and the gospel, and I had to make that really small, but that yellow right there uh, is the law of Moses and the gospel. They are congruent at the same time. According to them, between Acts 2 and A.D. 70, the law of Moses was still in effect and the gospel was in, in effect. Now, they would say that the law of Moses began to lose its power, began to decrease, and was finally out of the picture in A.D. 70. And while that was happening at the same time, they would say the gospel began to increase and it was in full force in A.D. 70. But the bottom line is they had the law of Moses and the gospel going on at the same time, uh, which, of course, we'll look at in just a moment, uh, is ridiculous, okay? And so that's the basic timelines that you have there uh, with the AD 70 uh, doctrine there. All right, now there's some other terms that are used to describe this doctrine, uh, but you see why it's called AD 70. And I don't know who nicknamed it that. I don't think... Max King did, but anyway, because A.D. 70 is, is the time. You know, the way we think of Pentecost, they think of A.D. 70. In fact, I was talking to a brother uh, not too long ago on the phone about it, uh, doesn't live too far from here, but he was saying, and of course he was saying that you could almost mock them by, by quoting passages that talk about the blood of Christ. You know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your vain conversation by the tradition of your fathers. But, you know, the scripture says, but with the precious blood of Christ. He says, just insert that, but with the destruction of Jerusalem. And uh, take all those passages and put that in there to kind of mock them because they put so much importance on the destruction of Jerusalem. You know, as we looked at before, to them, this is when the kingdom came into effect right here. Not Acts 2 but A.D. 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem. All right, now these other terms to describe it, we realized before, uh, realized eschatology is one way to describe it, and fulfilled eschatology. If you see these terms, that's, that's the same code name for A.D. 70. Now eschatology uh, comes from two, well, the, the breakdown of that word eschatos is a Greek word for last or last things. So the study of the, the end of time, the study of resurrection, judgment day, and all that falls under the category of eschatology. And so when it says realize, and of course ology is the study of, and so when it says realized eschatology, it's saying that, that it's already happened. The end times have already happened. And again, fulfilled eschatology, the same idea, everything has already happened. Uh, I did speak to one of these guys for uh, two, two and a half hours, just him and I in our Bibles uh, in, his, um, in his little breakfast area in his house. And I remember it was Mother's Day 2014 because I had to leave and drive two hours and make sure I was here for graduation because that's when FSOP graduated. And, you know, I need to be here for that, of course. Um, but that's how I remember it was on Mother's Day. Uh, and he just flat out told me, he said, there is nothing in the Bible that addresses anything past A.D. 70. 
And, um, and I asked him, I said, well, what's going to happen to you when you die? He says, well, I'm going to be with God for eternity. I said, well, what passage will tell you that? And, you know, well, over here in Matthew 24, you know, uh, so he, he would never answer the question. He'd always go along. But those are some names for it. All right, now, in more academic circles, it'll be referred to as full preterism or preterism, just plain preterism. And uh, that comes from a Latin term, which means past. And so past-ism. Uh, again, it's saying that full preterism says that all biblical prophecies were completely fulfilled by A.D. 70. All biblical prophecies were completely fulfilled by A.D. 70. And again, and so those, those terms kind of shed a lot more light upon what this doctrine is teaching here. All right, now when we think about this doctrine, and uh, again, it's, you know, I was dealing with it ever since March in uh, 2014. Now, now, when I was in the school of preaching here from 1989 to 91, we did talk about it, but I never knew anybody that actually believed that and really wondered how anybody could believe that. Uh, but, you know, people can take a look at Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. And they can explain that away, too. So, you know, it doesn't surprise me. But, um, and then a couple months later in June, somebody from, from Michigan called me up and said he's dealing with that up there. I'm like, wow, you know, because we had never heard of this in a long time, and then all of a sudden we're both dealing with it. And so there are pockets of it starting to rise again. And so, you know, history repeats itself. And so, you know, it's better to be uh, forewarned and forearmed for in case this stuff comes around here. All right, but uh, there's a I say all that to say there's a bunch of what I call sub-doctrines uh, that are part of this AD 70 thing. And not everybody agrees on the sub-doctrines. Well, what are the sub-doctrines? Well, some of the sub-doctrines are universalism. Uh, that is, everybody's going to be saved in the end. And uh, I've been told that Max King actually started believing that before he passed away, which when we get to one passage that I'll show you here in just a moment, that would be a, you know, if you, if you took that doctrine and uh, you carried it out to its extreme, that is what would happen, universalism, that is everybody's going to be saved. Uh, another sub-doctrine would be there's some that don't even believe that Jesus is God, uh, one of the main proponents of this up in Michigan, uh, he came out of Jehovah's Witnesses, and uh, some, I don't know if he does or not, but some of them actually take that, 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 that view that Jesus is not God, that he is some kind of quasi-deity created first by God, and then he created everything else, etc. That's one of the sub-doctrines, not all would agree with that. Uh, another one is, is that resurrection is always spiritual and all this kind of stuff. And so there's a lot of sub-doctrines that all would not agree with, but three commonly held doctrines among them all. We mentioned this already. All Bible prophecies are fulfilled by AD 70. Uh, again, we mentioned this one. The Messianic kingdom did not fully come until AD 70. And then Christ is not coming again at any time in the future. Uh, they will explain the judgment passages. They say all that has to do with it was done in A.D. 70, and there will be no final account of sin at the end of time, but God just simply judges us as we live our lives and go about our business. And um, one thing uh, I will say here, um, you know, why would anybody be attracted to this doctrine? I don't know for sure, but the handful of people that I know that really go for this uh, have what we might say skeletons in the closet, you know, uh, past things that they've been involved with and still are involved with and such. And so perhaps the idea that, um, you know, there's no going to be no final account of judgment is appealing to some. Uh, but whatever the case, uh, they do hold, for the most part, to these three main core doctrines of that view, okay? Well, we want to spend the rest of our time here on passages that refute the AD 70 doctrine. All right, now there's, there are just really from Genesis to, Re to Revelation, there's all kinds of passages, but I want to start out with some that, um, that in my discussions with them one-on-one -on -one anyway, they're just ungetoverable, um, just ungetoverable, and uh, you can tell when, when I sit down and talk with them because they have no answer for it, they just want to go here, go there, and not stick with the, the topic at hand, which is a common uh, strategy 
for dealing with stuff that can't be answered. All right, but the first one I want to go to is Matthew 24. Look at Matthew 24. And I don't know that I've preached a whole lesson on Matthew 24 uh, here, um, but um, there's all kinds of stuff here. Now, Matthew 24 and 25 are what's called the Olivet Discourse. And uh, really the context of this begins in verse, uh, I'd like to go to 2337, Matthew 2337. And Matthew 23 is, remember, Jesus' sternest denunciations against the scribes and Pharisees and the hypocrites. And he really, really calls them on the carpet here and exposes their sin. And so he gets um, uh, to verse uh, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall, uh, not, you, shall, uh, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. All right, so he just denounced the Pharisees and scribes, and now he says how he wanted to save them and do something for their condition, but they refused him. But notice 38, your house is left unto you desolate. Well, what is their house? Uh, their house literally is the temple. Figuratively, it's their whole system of religion, but your house is left desolate. Now 24.1. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And so he says, Your house is left unto you desolate. He starts walking away from the temple and the area there. His disciples come unto them to show him, look at all these buildings of the temple. And Jesus responds by saying, there shall not one stone be left upon another. The whole thing is going to be thrown down. And so in verse 3, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, hence the Olivet Discourse, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? New King James has a question mark. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Question mark. Most translations have two question marks in here. Some translations have one, one question mark at the end. And uh, there's probably one somewhere, though I haven't seen it, but I haven't looked at them all, that may even have three question marks in here. Uh, and so, you know, and again, punctuation wasn't in the original manuscript, so it's the judgment of the translators. But either way you look at it, there's three parts to the question. Or there's three parts that they are asking about. Now notice the first part, when shall these things be? Now what are, what are the these things? The these things are one stone not left upon another. Your house is left unto you desolate. When are you going to destroy the temple and the buildings around the temple? The second part of that question, what is the sign of your coming? How will we know when you're coming? And notice, because again, verse chapter 23, 39, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then the third part of this, and the end of the age. And I believe the new King, or the old King James has the end of the world, maybe. Does it have the end of the world? Yeah, the end of the world, end of the age, maybe it's the end of the age, I don't know. But anyway, those two words are sometimes English words are from the same Greek word. All right? And so when he answers the questions, now again, the last two parts of that question, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age, the apostles consider those two, two as the same thing, which is probably why there's only one question mark there on those two. Uh, but in their mind, just like in the Old Testament Jews, they could not imagine the world existing without the temple. Uh, if you read the prophecies, particularly of Ezekiel and Jeremiah, um, you know, they had the idea that as long as they were around the temple, they were safe. Like little children playing tag, you know, I'm on base, and the temple is base, Jerusalem's base, we're okay. Well, God woke them up, told them otherwise, but as Jesus begins to answer this, and, um, well, verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end 
is not near. All right? The end is not near. The end of the age is not near. But even though these things are going to happen, for nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. They will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will arise and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. And so the end's not going to come till the gospel is preached, but remember it's not until Acts 2 and following that it goes out to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whosoever reads, let him understand. And this goes back to the book of Daniel. Uh, and uh, when you see some things happening, you're going to know that something's, something's up. Uh, then let those who are in Jerusalem flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of the house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may, be in the win may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. Now, what's with the winter and Sabbath? Well, the gates of Jerusalem are closed in the winter and in the Sabbath. And a pregnant lady would not have to flee Jerusalem under those circumstances because she's pregnant. And that's why he had that, that thing in there for there, then. But notice you will see these things. You will know when it's time to get out of Jerusalem. Verse 21. And there will be great tribulation such as not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved for the elect's sake, and those days be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. False Christ shall arise, false prophets will arise, and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you Beforehand, In other words, do not think that this is the end of the world. In fact, in, in these verses, he is warning them not to think of the end of the world so soon. That when you see all this stuff, this is not the end of the world. It's the end of Jerusalem, but not the end of the world. Therefore, if they say to you, look, here he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there will be eagles will be gathered together immediately after the tribulation of those days. And here's an apocalyptic description of the end of something. The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds and one end of the heaven to the other. Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know it is near at the doors. Now what is the it? What is that that they're going to see? It's going to be the destruction of Jerusalem. Now he does give, we don't have time to spend on this, we can maybe say that for another lesson. He does give the des destruction of Jerusalem in apocalyptic terms that are similar to his end of the world description in some places. But again, what he's talking about here, they're going to know it's coming. They're going to be able to see it. They're going to be able to feel it. They're going to be able to have warning to get out of town, get out of Jerusalem before it's too late. Now notice in verse 34, Assuredly I say to you, this generation, not 2015, not even when Matthew wrote it, but when Jesus spoke it, he said, This generation will by no means pass away, till all these things take place. That is, everything he has just described is going to take place in that generation. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will in no means pass away. All right, now, verse 35 ends his talk about the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, how do I know that? Well, the main way I know that, look at verse 36. But of that day and hour... 
no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. All right, we've already looked at that three-part question. All right, we looked at that. Now notice there's a big distinction between this and these. Again, in verse 35, this generation will by no means pass away till these things take place. All right, now this, I didn't put it up here, but this is a demonstrative pronoun in the Greek language as it is in English. But in Greek, the word this and, and its plural these refers to something right here. That and its plural those refers to something down the line. And so when Jesus says, verse 34, this generation will not pass away till these things take, take place. But then verse 36 is a definite transition. But of that day and hour knows no man, no, not the Father, or no, not the angels, but my Father only. And so that day is distinct from these things. And so he's talking about something yet future. In other words, the two events from 4 through 35 and 36 through 51 are two different events. One is the destruction of Jerusalem. The other is the end of the age. And um, verse chapter 25, he gives two parables to illustrate readiness for the end of time. Like the, the, the virgins, five foolish, five wise. What was the difference? Five were prepared, five weren't. They didn't know when, he was going, when the bridegroom was going to come, but five were not ready. Moral of the story, be ready. Stay ready so you don't have to get ready. And then he gives them one about the talents. They were given talents. And again, the, the lesson there is use your talents wisely because you know not when the Lord is going to return. And so the whole thing is about judgment. It, and then in Matthew 25, you have the two parables, and then you have the judgment scene, verses 31 through 46. Uh, but again, that passage, verse 36 by itself, refutes that doctrine uh, of AD 70 because it makes a distinction between the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the world, which, by the way, the second verse in Jesus is coming soon blurs that, uh, you know, that, that, that talk because when these signs come to pass, the signs he's talking about in Matthew 24 are the destruction of Jerusalem, not the end of time. Uh, there used to be a phrase back in the time, the signs of the time. Well, there is no sign of the second coming, but there was of the destruction of Jerusalem. But again, the lesson is stay ready to keep from having to get ready. The second passage we want to look at, we're only going to look at three of these, so don't worry about that. We'll, we'll make sure we get out in time. Um, in Romans chapter 7, turn to that passage, Romans chapter 7. Let me read that for you uh, in Romans 7. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the husband, or bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. And so he gives an illustration by mar of marriage. But notice the point of this, therefore, verse 4, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you be, may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. So what he is saying here, in order to be married to another husband, in verse 4 tells us it's a covenant, in order to be married to another husband, the first must be dead. If the first is still alive, the second is adultery. And he uses that, 1 through 3, based upon a literal marriage, then verse 4, he makes the application to covenants. All right, so the AD 70, again, has coexisting law of Moses in the gospel, and that requires spiritual adultery. Again, if you notice again, uh, they had the law of Moses existing jointly with the gospel between Acts 2 and AD 70. Well, Paul refers to that explicitly in Romans 7, verse 4, as spiritual adultery. Uh, and so the AD 70 doctrine would require. So 
you know, here you have a Jew living under the law of Moses, um, or, or, you know, you have a Jew, if a Jew asks you, what must I do to be saved? Well, 80 said he would say, obey the law of Moses till, it, till it's out of the way. Well, if he obeys the law of Moses over here, okay, uh, when he should be obeying the God, I mean, if he obeys, the, well, either way, if he's married to this, he can't be married to that. But if a guy's married to this, and this is still alive, he's committing adultery. And so how could a Jew, anyway, obey the gospel when this is still alive? It'd be like a woman having two husbands, but bound by the law by this husband, yet the gospel is there. And so it's just complete, um, realized, contradictology, okay? All right? The next one we'll look at here, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, the last one we'll look at in any detail here, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 21 and 22. Now again, this is in that resurrection chapter, the whole chapter is about the resurrection, the bodily resurrection. Uh, For since by man came death, now in this section he is contrasting Adam and Christ. By what man came death? Adam. What death is he talking about? Spiritual or physical? Well, physical is what he's talking about here. Uh, And we'll see this. By man also came the resurrection of the dead. Which man is that? That's Christ. By him came the resurrection of the dead. And here's the key. For as in Adam all die. Again, we do not die because of Adam's sin. We don't die spiritually because of Adam. Romans 5 verse 12 says, For by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men, comma, for that all have sinned. All right? We die when we sin. Calvinism is false. We do not inherit the guilt of Adam's sin. We, you know, the father does not... Uh, you know, he's not guilty for the son's sins. The son's not guilty for his father's sins on earth. All right? <clears throat> no matter how many generations you go. All right? So in verse 22, as in Adam, all die. If that's saying we all die spiritually in Adam, then God makes us sinners. But he doesn't. But since he did cast Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, they had no more access to the tree of life, whereby they would eat and live forever, Genesis 3:22. All of us die physically. But the latter part of verse 22, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And so the death and life here is physical. I guess I should say are physical. Physical death results from Adam's sin, Genesis 3, through 24. Physical life at the resurrection is from Christ. In other words, the latter part of this verse 22 cannot be spiritual. If all are made alive by Christ spiritually, that's universalism. That's what I was getting at before. 80, 70, so they must make physical death. And in other words, in, and they, he even told me that in this passage. The first part is physical death. The second part is spiritual life. But yet if that's the case, if Christ is going to raise all spiritually, then that means everybody's going to be saved. And so when I sat down and talked to that guy and asked him about that, he wanted to go back to Matthew 24 and change the subject. But it's either, you can't, there's no way out of that. It's physical death, physical life at the resurrection. And the whole chapter is that, that same context. It is buried, or it is sown in corruption. It is raised incorruptible. He's not talking about a spirit. He's talking about a body. And we'll have to save the rest of that for another lesson. We won't look at this. We had a whole lesson on this a while ago. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 25, then cometh the end. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And my friends, I don't care if you make that death physical or if you make that death spiritual, is death still happening? Absolutely. And so death wasn't done away at AD 70. It uh, still goes on. And the last one, Hebrews 9, 27, 28, Kenny just read that for us. It's a point of the man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sin of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Uh, humans die. I should take the S off of that. Humans die because of sin. I had man dies. That's about changed man. That went better to think I was being a, a, you know, dissing women. But humans die because of sin. 
Christ died to save us from sin. Humans die to face judgment. Christ died to save us from judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Then to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Jesus is coming again. Do not be deceived. And there's going to come a day when this world is going to end. Like that song we sing, the clouds are going to be rolled back as a scroll. The Lord's going to come from heaven with his mighty angels. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Uh, Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Matthew 25, 31 through, thir or, uh, yeah, 31 through 46. Jesus is coming again. And the great, the good news, the great news is we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to fear that if we've obeyed the gospel. Tonight, there might be some that have not yet obeyed the gospel. We must believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We must repent of our sins. We must confess our faith in him. We must be baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins. If you have not done that tonight, why not do that? Why not make January 25th your spiritual birthday? Have your sins forgiven. Rise to walk in newness of life and serve God. If you've done that in the past but have not been living faithfully, we have an opportunity to make it right. Jesus is calling us. He wants us to come to him. But what are we waiting for? Why do we wait? Let's come right now and get right with God, even together as we stand and sing this song. Won't you come?